That's my intro. <laughs> oh, let us pray. Lord, help me in the sharing of these words that they may challenge and inspire my friends gathered here today to walk in the path of your calling. Amen. When Martha asked me to speak for this series, immediately three people came to mind. Mother Teresa for her absolute dedication, the Dalai Lama for his ability to approach life with joyfulness, and Archbishop Desmond Tutu for his all-inclusive love and teaching on forgiveness. I went home to reflect on the decision, and in the end, I chose the Anglican. As I came to know more and more about the Archbishop, it became apparent that he exemplified all three of the traits I so admired, dedication, joy, and forgiveness. What came through again and again was his deep, deep love of humanity and his message that as a Christian, it is a requirement to forgive. In her service at the eight o'clock service recently, Reverend Marion made reference to Desmond Tutu and the path to forgiveness that he taught. After the service, I shared with her that I would be preaching on the Archbishop, and she said she'd heard him speak and that he was most inspiring. And she began to demonstrate. He started his speech with, God loves the white people. God loves the black people. God loves yellow. God loves red people. God loves people of all color. God loves the gays. God loves the lesbians. God loves the tall, the short, the skinny, the fat. God loves people with big noses, says the bishop with his very big nose. God loves all people of all faiths. God loves all people. And we too are called to love all of humanity. God is all-inclusive. The South Africa that Desmond Tutu grew up in was far from it. He was born on October 7, 1931, to a poor family. His father was a teacher and his mother was a domestic worker. To imagine the courage and the fearlessness shown by Tutu, we need to understand the world of apartheid that he lived in and its impact on the non-white citizens of South Africa. Apartheid is an Afrikaans word meaning apartness. In 1948, the white National Party government began formalizing policies of racial segregation and economic discrimination against non-whites. There were 148 apartheid laws that were passed. Significantly, non-whites had to carry ID permits at all times, obey strict curfews, public facilities and services were separated, marriages between white and non-white were banned. Uh, it removed people from their homes and placed them in segregated neighborhoods. It put 13% of the land and allocated it to 90% of the population. There was a separate system of education for non-whites which was grossly underfunded and minimized the opportunity for academic achievement. Desmond Tutu grew up in this system of repression where people were divided into four groups, white, black, Indian, and colored. In the midst of such repression, there were many uprisings, marches, peaceful and not so peaceful demonstrations. I just wanna pause because the whole time that I was doing this presentation, I kept having to stop and reflect on Canada, our history, and our relationship with our you know, Aboriginal uh, family. So I'm not going to go into it, into it, but kind of tuck it away and be thinking about that as I continue through my presentation. So there were many players in the anti-apartheid movement. International attention was brought to the injustices of the apartheid system, and there was a strong reaction, particularly after police killings of unarmed protesters, including children. They were removed from the Commonwealth. The UN recommended trade sanctions. They were suspended from the Olympics and then later expelled. There were anti-apartheid leaders within the country and a lot of support from without. Desmond Tutu was one of many players within the country who fought against apartheid. He became a symbol of the nonviolent struggle against apartheid. He was respected greatly and became the first black bishop of Johannesburg, 
the first black archbishop of Cape Town in 1986, and the same year he became the first black president of the All-African Conference of Churches. These positions brought about many speaking engagements, and he was always very clear in his statement that apartheid was evil. He said over and over that God has intended us for fellowship, for togetherness, without destroying our distinctiveness or our cultural otherness. He was often accompanied on his speaking engagement with his wife and his daughter, Mafol. When he would begin to speak, his daughter said that she would lean over and murmur to her mother, and she'd say, oh, speech number six, or speech number 14. And the bishop was unapologetic um, because he said, he was repetitive, true enough, because he had one fundamental message, the importance of community and respect for others. But I have to admit, when I read sort of what Mafo had murmured to her mother, that I sort of stopped and I thought, ah, oh, yes, I can just imagine when Jesus was speaking and the disciples are standing on the side and they're saying, ah, oh, yes, parable number three. Because I'm sure he had to, over and over again, the, the, the words that he had to share were important for everybody to hear. Tutu believed in dialogue. He spoke at Afrikaans university campuses and, ma and many mainly Afrikaans organizations and groups. The Afrikaans are the white guys, just in case you were wondering, or not sure. Many of the black community felt it was a waste of time talking to whites. He disagreed because he believed it was essential to give a clear statement of his position and beliefs. He would strongly state, my passionate opposition to the evil and pernicious policy of apartheid has nothing to do with a political or any other ideology. It has everything to do with my faith as a Christian and my understanding of the imperative of the gospel of Jesus Christ. An authentic Christian spirituality is utterly subversive to any system that would treat a man or a woman as anything less than a child of God. There have been many decades of protest and violence. Much blood was shed. When black leaders began to be released from jail, significantly Nelson Mandela, after 27 years of imprisonment, the fear was that the transition to democracy would be a bloodbath of revenge and retaliation. When Nelson Mandela became the first black president in 1994, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was formed, and the hearing started in 1996. Bishop Tutu was chosen to chair the commission. He believed that there was no end to the human capacity for healing. He held to two simple truths. There is nothing that cannot be forgiven, and there is no one undeserving <clears throat> of forgiveness. Ghastly acts must always be condemned, but we can never relinquish the hope that the doers of the most heinous deeds can and may change. The stories told at the commission were horrific and blood curdling. Many tears were shed, yet there were some extraordinary acts of forgiveness as perpetrator and victim embraced and even did so publicly. The path chosen was forgiveness. For all of us, there have been times when we have needed to forgive. There have been times when we have needed to be forgiven. Whether it is a tormentor who tortured brutally, the bully who poking relentlessly, a parent who was abusive, the guy who cut you off on the road, the neighbor leaving broken bottles on your lawn and swearing in front of young children, or the granddaughter who erases your entire presentation from the laptop <laughs> while she's looking for Netflix. Yep, that happened. <laughs> the harm may be small or it may be soul crushing, but we're all called upon to forgive. Forgiveness is one of the most profound, pervasive, and powerful teachings in the Bible, but also one of the most difficult. Archbishop Tutu and his daughter Mafo wrote a book together called The Book of Forgiving. They tell us forgiveness is a choice and offer a fourfold path to forgiveness. In our humanness, we experience some hurt, harm, or loss, and the result is pain. The choice then is to choose harm and seek retaliation and revenge and carry bitterness and hatred, or we can choose to heal, and he offers four steps. It's important to keep in mind that forgiveness is not easy. 
It's not a weakness. It requires a fearless remembering of the hurt. It may not be quick. It can take several journeys through the cycle of remembering and grieving before one can truly forgive and be free. We know that it is good and helpful to let go of resentment, but how do we let go when we've been harmed? The tutu has outlined the following. Step one, to tell the story. Carefully and fully review the facts of the event, except that it can't be undone. From that moving to step two is to name the hurt. Identify the feelings with the facts, remembering that there are no feelings that are wrong or bad or invalid, and allow yourself to grieve. Struggle through the anger, grief, and sadness, and push against the pain and suffering on the way to forgiving. Move forward when you are ready. The third step, and you might have to do one and two a few times if it's you know something really, really tough, but the third step is granting forgiveness, which might be in person or just within yourself. And then fourthly is to renew or release the relationship. Forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting, which is probably impossible anyway. It does not mean that we ignore our anger and hurt. It just isn't healthy to do that. Forgiveness is a choice, the simple choice to love rather than to harm the person in return. By choosing love over vengeance, we free ourselves from remaining stuck in our pain. We free others to experience a love that leads to gratitude and reconciliation. And we free everybody for the possibility of being united with Christ's own loving heart. I have a sister-in-law who is of the Cree Nation and attended the residential school in Winnipeg. She is a devout Christian. <laughs> and I, I couldn't understand that. And I asked her, you know, how can you choose to be a, a Christian when you were so abused at that Christian residential school? And she said it was because of the teachings of Jesus on forgiveness. And she always held on to his words on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Archbishop Tutu is one of the most exceptional Christian leaders of our time. He was a key figure in the overthrow of a regime most evil. He led the way forward to a just society that promoted reconciliation without revenge. He showed absolute determination, expressing his beliefs and sharing his dreams publicly. Always true to his faith, his love of Christ, his generosity of spirit, the immensity of his vision, his courage, and his values grounded in faith are an inspiration. Now that's kind of the end of this. However, uh, I was, when I was at the library and picking up all these books um, by Desmond Tutu, I came upon the most exceptional book. And you know, one of the things I do enjoy at church especially is the uh, children's service and the homily and the beauty and the simplicity of explaining some sometimes difficult Christian concepts. So the bishop very kindly wrote a book and I'm gonna read you a story. It's called God's Dream and it's Bishop Tutu and a friend who have written it. Dear child of God, what do you dream about in your loveliest of dreams? Do you dream about flying high or rainbows reaching across the sky? Do you dream about being free to do what your heart desires? Or about being treated like a full person no matter how young you are? Do you know what God dreams about? If you close your eyes and look with your heart, I am sure, dear child, that you will find out. God dreams about people sharing. God dreams about people caring. God dreams that we reach out and hold one another's hands and play one another's games and laugh with one another's hearts. But God does not force us to be friends or to love one another. Dear child of God, it does happen that we get angry and hurt one another. Soon we start to feel sad and so very alone. Sometimes we cry and God cries with us. But when we say we're sorry and forgive one another, we wipe away our tears 
and God's tears too. Each of us carries a piece of God's heart within us, and when we love one another, the pieces of God's heart are made whole. God dreams that every one of us will see that we are all brothers and sisters, yes, even you and me, even if we have different mummies and daddies or live in different faraway lands. Even if we speak different languages or have different ways of talking to God, even if we have different eyes or different skin, even if you are taller and I am smaller, even if your nose is little and mine is large. Dear child of God, do you know how to make God's dream come true? It is really quite easy. As easy as sharing, loving, caring, as easy as holding, playing, laughing, as easy as knowing we are family because we are all God's children. Will you help God's dream come true? Let me tell you a secret. God smiles like a rainbow when you do. Thank you, Bishop Tutu. Amen.